There's a lot of kids out there who need your help, and a donation could potentially save them. Links to my fundraiser is in the description. I have talked about DLC in the past, and even despite all the stupid and at times even terrible things that can be done with it, the idea can lend to a lot of creative ways to expand upon a game and give it more longevity. Even if it doesn't change one's own opinion on a game, the fact that the devs are willing to offer more of what people liked about it is always great. And heck, when they do that for completely free, it's just as great, and it's what I want to talk about today. The practice of free content updates isn't always used to the fullest, but we're at a point now where just hearing the idea is enough to warrant groans out of people. Why is that? And why does it continue to see use in spite of all that? Well, for my first journal video, I want to look over it in concept and why I still think it has a place in the modern market, and make cases for how it can be used, as well as look how improperly it's used and why exactly these reactions are warranted. So, on surface level, free content updates seem like something that everyone would be down for. Getting more things to play with and show off over time in a game where you only spent the base price you paid to get the game, as opposed to paying the initial price plus anything extra for whatever paid DLC there is available, does sound like a great deal. Whether it be new costumes, new characters, or even new modes, there's something to look forward to. And personally, I'm mostly okay when a game adopts the idea, and I think it should be valued in places. Like, no matter how much you play a game, it's only a matter of time before you start getting tired of it and try something else. That's just how regular human psychology works. But with the right setup, this model does have the ability to mitigate that while not charging you extra money. But in order to find the reason why a lot of people's trust in the idea has sharply diminished in the recent years, we need to look at what can make these work, which boils down to two things. The first thing that there needs to be is a proper ratio of what's going to be included at launch, especially if the game in question is being charged at full retail value. If you're charging a high amount of money for a game where the interest can easily die down after a number of hours, it's a big ask for people to wait until the next update comes and include something that people may or may not like. The second is that there needs to be a plan in regards to what you're going to introduce and when you're going to do it. I get it. Game development takes time, especially in this day and age where working in buildings is much riskier. But there's a reason why free content update games have a roadmap for these kinds of things. Take Avengers 2020 for example. The base game can give you a decently sized campaign, as well as tons of different missions to complete as well as an online mode where you can do them with others. But over time they added new characters and new campaigns that felt like genuine continuations of what the base game already provided. The size of these campaigns is debatable, as well as how you feel about it if you want to go that far. But the fact of the matter is, the game provided enough to warrant the initial price tag, and then the players have more of what was already provided without any extra cost, which made it all worth it, at least in my eyes. And for cases like this that do continuous expansions, it paced out well to keep the fanbase interested. At least until after the War for Wakanda expansion, where things got kinda slower, but eh, details. I personally felt like the game was really enjoyable in its base state, because it set the overall main story and the online missions as the focus first and foremost, before going in to include all the extras later on, none of which felt like it was held back initially. This practice can even take the form of single updates, which can go a long way as well. For example, Shantae and the Seven Sirens had a giant update that added in completely new modes that ranged from rebalancing the design, to adding more to the characterization, essentially addressing criticisms the base game had, to let you go nuts with how you want to restrict yourself in terms of monster cards, or the general difficulty. Or how about Pokemon Legends Arceus, which added in more tough battles and introduced a new kind of swarm to make tasks easier. Heck, I'll even vouch for Kirby Star Allies. Sure, the campaign is one of the easiest it has ever been for the series, that's why it feels a lot more rudimentary compared to what came before, but the base game still had roughly the same amount of content as the 3DS entries, with things like the arenas and the minigames, and the extra mode that allowed you to take control of literally any recruitable enemy in the game, as well as Men Knight, DDD, and Bandana Wall D, meaning you have a ton of different ways you could play it. But they decided to not only add new characters from previous Kirby games in there, but also redesign some levels to make use of their abilities, as well as add even more on top of that. These games already felt satisfactory and complete in their initial state, and you're not missing out on anything that integral without these updates. But with these updates, they show that each of these devs are willing to not only give more of what they promised, but also try and touch some things up. And with multiplayer games, the free content update is much more common, but arguably more integral. The feeling of burning yourself out is especially noticeable here, since every mode is likely going to be to the point and not as beefy, so it's ideal to keep on including new things as well as make tweaks to what's already there in order to keep the player base interested, especially if the game in question has a large player base or is free to play. But coupled with the necessity to make the core gameplay solid and expand on it, 
Each passing update does allow for many different chances of doing this, like say with Rocket League's battle, basketball, or hockey modes, all of which add new twists onto what players are already familiar with. Or how Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled both tweet the gameplay to be more accessible and enjoyable, but also added in new characters, cards, and costumes for free, and also structured an entire part of the game that convinced players to continue playing. All the while making sure most of the stuff people care about is easier to get, while saving the more minor stuff for later on. Granted, the microtransaction stuff is still gross, I will never defend it, but at least it wasn't that much of a hassle to get the more important stuff without spending real money. Not to mention getting weapon coins in the game is very easy, and everything that was offered in the Grand Prix events got added to the normal shop. And of course there's obligatory inclusions like mobile games, MOBAs, Team Fortress 2, Overwatch, and Fortnite, all of which are constantly updating with new things to get, and maybe even more ways to play the game. So you understand what I'm getting at here. Free content updates can still be done really well. Heck, in some cases, it can be a way for devs to reach out to their fanbase and tell them thank you, and it can extend the life of the game in a nice way. But I can see why many people have grown weary of this model. You might have put together that you can easily do this model wrong based on the two big factors. While I love Nintendo, and I think they mostly do this well, even I can admit that they have some of the most infamous offender of how it can be done incorrectly. Mario Golf Super Rush is probably the one that will instantly come to mind, and the one I think broke people's trust in this model to begin with. From what I've gathered at least, the core gameplay is still enjoyable, but the lack of anything to do at launch, and the way story mode was set up, was really a deal breaker for tons of people, and the rate in which future content came out really didn't help. Same thing goes for Mario Tennis Aces, as it took almost a full year to get stuff like character cutscenes, and some of the modes added in were from previous games. Luigi. So with a lot of games launching in unsatisfactory states and being artificially drawn out, people assume this is going to be normal, and that's what caused the rift, and that's disappointing! And sometimes it can be done badly in a sense where the priority is more so on imitating things that worked in mobile games, or games that are free to play, and use those traits to persuade players into spending money, or use so much of their time grinding in order to get one thing. Something we've been seeing from companies like Square Enix quite a lot. Now, I may not necessarily be bothered by how Avengers does this, as the only thing it offers are just cosmetics, but people have just used its presence against it because it came out in an environment where Square keeps on using it in their products, like say Babylon's Fall or Shogun OGP, some which to downright egregious levels. The fact that a lot of these are very recent leads to the other thing people have grown to dislike towards, the frequency in which this model pops up. Going back to Nintendo for a second, despite how well or poorly they managed to pull it off, we've seen them do it so many times that it's becoming annoying. There's the aforementioned Kirby Star Allies, Mario Golf Super Rush, and Mario Tennis Aces, and to be fair, all the Splatoon and Mario Maker games make good use of it, but Nintendo Switch Sports is doing it by adding golf in the fall, and it took Animal Crossing a really long time to add in things like swimming. Most of these are genuinely fun at their core, but the fact that people were able to see what the game has to offer in a relatively short amount of time really hurt the longevity. I also think something else that's bothering people about this is that a lot of these are falling off our previously established series, some of which technically had more to do in other installments, and some of which technically aren't games that are meant to be played in hour-long sessions. To use another recent example, I believe the Mario Strikers games are meant to be enjoyed in shorter bursts than usual, 30 to 45 minute long sessions at most, and I think the Battle League not being too much different from that, while already planning to add things post-launch before it even came out, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. But the fact that it is better enjoying small bursts does leave it a little more prone to it being dropped after a period of time, all the while charging $60 and telling the public they are playing with the updates after the game came out. In that case, it's easy to understand why some did not remain optimistic, especially since it is possible that time frames were thought of after the product came out. I'll still be excited for what they've got planned though, since I enjoy the game. I do understand companies do want to release certain games at a certain time so that marketing for a product they want to sell can be easier, and delaying a game entirely isn't as simple as flipping a switch. But it all hits home the point that the timing of when you do what, absolutely matters. So in a way, while I really don't like that people have been calling this the finish it later approach, nor do I like that some also call these kinds of games lazy and soulless because of how unbelievably self-righteous and spoiled those come off as, I don't exactly blame anyone for taking a dislike towards free content updates, and I can understand why examples of it being done badly are used to reinforce having as much in the game as possible at launch. Companies like Nintendo, Square, or what have you have used free updates with a plan and a good pace of war, but not all the time, and the times where it's not been done very well have unfortunately broken the camel's back, especially when it comes to the frequency of it all. Using this kind of thing in your products over and over again within a relatively short time frame will not only burn people out, but it also builds up work that needs to get done, and it will eventually become too much to handle, especially if you do it without a plan. I don't think companies should just get rid of this model entirely, and I will continue to support it because it can be done very well. They wouldn't keep doing it if it wasn't working in some form. But it's clear the public opinion on it has shifted for the worse, because of all the highly questionable things you can do with it. 
It not only takes some really good examples to change people's minds on it, but also breaks in between when it's used, because if things go too out of control, it will run its course. I am not here to say, don't give companies a free pass just because they did something you like, or to rally you up against a certain company and basically make them look like the bad guy. That isn't who I am, and I will never be that way. I'm here to say that regardless of what your opinion is on the matter, I think the best way to approach the problem and bring the model to the best it can be, is make the call if you're going to purchase a game that does this at launch, and if you feel like it could do the updates better, try to give player feedback to the developers in some form, and let your playtime hours speak to them. I am aware this idea has a bunch of holes in it, as not only do we live in an economy where people choose how much a game is worth to them, but also some people will undoubtedly get more of the experience of a base game than others, and it's also a plan that doesn't happen overnight, and requires a lot more of the community, as well as the devs. Not to mention statistics don't always communicate the right lesson, and the amount of effective feedback that has come from social media websites like Twitter have been very hit or miss. But at that point, we need to accept that there really is not a foolproof plan to fix the current mess that has happened. That's why the most we can, and probably should do, is acknowledge when free content updates are done well or poorly, and let the ones that are done well be an example for others to follow, as well as try to help any that could use improvement, as well as call out any questionable business practices that might arise from it. And someday, maybe the potential of free content updates will be fully realized. I'm the Lightning Ripper, and thank you for watching.